Hello, loyal listeners. This is Patrick, one of the hosts of Movie House Memories, coming to you before the show today for two things. One, to thank you for continuing to listen to us as we go into uh, our nearly 30th episode of Movie House Memories, uh, a little podcast that the four of us created starting in May of last year. We want to thank you all for listening in to us to this point in time and hope that you continue to listen to us in the future. Then we also want to apologize for some of the sound quality issues in this particular episode of The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. We had some issues over Skype. This is not a podcast that we did all together in the same place this particular night, and we tried to do our best. We stopped the recording a couple times and tried to reset the Skype, but it didn't actually work out. So there is portions of the podcast, although you can still hear us, that Chris and Matt and Lori sometimes sound a little echoey, like they're underwater. And we apologize for that. We try not to do that. Often, if we have the time, we'll re-record a podcast if the sound quality is poor. But in this particular case, Lori was going to be going on vacation. We wanted to make sure that we didn't miss an episode. So we went forward with it, and we put together an episode as best as we could. So we apologize for it. Hopefully, it doesn't happen again. It's all, um, But we just wanted to let you know. And now, without further ado... Uh, the Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. Matt's pick for one of the hundred greatest films of all time. Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to Middle Earth and another episode of Movie House Memories, the podcast where we look back and review the films that we think are the most important films in cinema history. I'm Patrick Gard, and with me, as always, are the three people who have spent a large portion of their lives in darkened movie theaters. First, he is the author of Duty on Our Empire, a 25th century love story, and the man who's the size of a hobbit but smells like a dwarf, Chris Haley. Hey, it doesn't matter if you're in a shire or not. That smell sticks with you forever. (laughs) Also with us is the woman who I have four hairs of, but she doesn't know how I got them. Lori Flores. <laughs> Hello. Was that Hori Flores? Lori Flores. <gasps> Chris. <laughs> That's what it sounded like. Finally, the man who has the feminine good looks of an Orlando Bloom, Matt Palmer. Uh, thanks, guys. Good, good to be here. Good to be here. You are the fairest elf I have ever seen, Matt. <laughs> I, I forgot to I forgot to think up an opening gag, and I feel <laughs> terrible about it now. All right, this week we're reviewing Matt's selection for one of the top 100 films of all time, The Lord of the Rings: The Fellowship of the Ring from 2001. And Matt, do you have a summary for us? Oh no, I'm just kidding. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this one's going to be epic. I've got that <laughs> feeling it will be. Please give me the first third of The Lord of the Rings. Story. Frodo lives an idyllic life in the Shire where he and his uncle hang out and smoke dope with a pointy hatted <laughs> wizard named Gandalf. When Frodo's uncle Bilbo Baggins retires to live with the elves in Miami, he leaves Bilbo all of his possessions, including a magic ring that can make the wearer disappear and that has a strange propensity to draw unspeakable evil near. Gandalf checks Wikipedia and learns that this so called One Ring created by the evil genius Sauron. The ring gives Sauron the power to control all creatures in Middle Earth. At least so long as you don't cut his hand off. If you do that, it kind of works against him. But, you know, I don't, I don't know the particulars of the magic. <laughs> Gandalf sends Frodo off with the ring and his fat hobbit friend Sam and their two goofy, totally straight friends, Merry and Pippin. They're supposed to meet him at a bar in town not too far away. On their way, they're pursued by some undead horsemen seeking the ring, ring wraiths. They narrowly escape to the town. While there, they meet Strider, a wandering fighting type who takes charge of them. Gandalf never meets the hobbits at the Prancing Pony. He went to meet his wizard friend, Saruman, to discuss what to do about the ring. But Saruman is a traitor and tries to get Gandalf to get him the ring so he can put it back on Sauron's middle finger where it belongs. On their way, 
their barbecue was crashed by the undead ring wraiths. They managed to rough up the hobbits and stab Frodo with a cursed piece of charcoal before Strider shoes them away with a torch in the business end of his sword. They rush Frodo to the elf hospital so someone immortal can suck out the poison, but the wraiths are hot on their tails. An elf chick named Arwen shows up and quickly leaves with Frodo and with Strider's heart. They narrowly escape to Rivendell, where Frodo is rushed through the elven healthcare system. Gandalf meets them there after a daring escape aided by a tiny bat and a somewhat large eagle. He tells Frodo he will never fully recover from the dose of poison charcoal he took at the barbecue, but he's man enough to carry on. The bigwigs at Rivendell call a council with leaders from the dwarves, the men, and the elves. They chew it over for a while and decide the best course to take is to walk the ring over to Mordor and toss it into an active volcano. That's a little harder than it sounds. So nobody wants to trust anyone else with the ring except for Frodo because he's already shown a remarkable resilience to the temptation to use it to gain power for oneself. So Frodo walks out of Rivendell with three hobbits, two men, a wizard, a dwarf, a gay elf, a priest, a rabbi, and a feminist. Their path to Mordor is filled with all kinds of troubles, so they decide to walk through the old dwarf mines in Moria. In Moria, a pack of elves hassles them, but they lighten up when chased by an ancient demon made of, made of fire wakes up Cranky. The gang, uh, the, sorry, the gang nearly escapes, but Gandalf does the noble thing and confronts the demon on a narrow stone bridge until both of them fall into the bottomless chasm below. Everyone cries like a sissy and runs into the woods, where they meet a hippie elf that can read minds and bottles light. She gives Frodo some words of advice and a small bottle of starlight and tells him all to beat cheeks to Mordor. Meanwhile, Saruman has built an army of super orc called Orakai with one purpose, to find the One Ring. They set off running after the Fellowship. Meanwhile, Boromir, one of the men in the party, gets greedy and tries to steal the ring from Frodo. He wants to use the ring to help defend his people from Mordor's constant attacks. But Frodo knows nobody can use the ring for good and hides from Boromir while the uruk close in on the group. Boromir ultimately re repents and helps defend the group from the attack while the elf, Strider, and the dwarf all fight for their lives. Frodo escapes into the lake along with Sam, but Merry and Pippin are captured and carried away by the uruk -hai. Frodo and Sam set off together to take the ring to Mordor. And the rest of the fellowship let them go, knowing that the ring will be too tempting to the rest of them. They set off to rescue Merry and Pippin. The film leaves us hanging as Sam and Frodo first step into Mordor. Yay! Then some other stuff happens in the next seven hours of the movie, and I, I can't recall exactly what. But... I, I'm sorry, Matt. Did you think this was an episode of Lunchtime Movie Review? or <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way to describe it. Okay. All right. We look back when we look back at the films. We look back at the times that they are made in, and we have uh, our lovely Lori Flores to give us some of those headlines and Lori Flores's headlines of the time. Take us back to 2001 again. <laughs> again, yes. And because we were going back again, I thought this time I would look at what would have happened if, or what the most prominent headlines were if the terrorist attacks hadn't happened. What, what, so. what was the last 2001 we did? Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone came, uh, out, okay. came out like three weeks before this movie. <laughs> A magical year. <laughs> it was. Yes. September 11, 2001, the hijacking of domestic airliners and deliberate crashing of them into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and a rural field in Pennsylvania dominated the news. What did the U.S. news look like before 8.47 a.m. on September 11? Well, there were rumors that Michael Jordan might come out of retirement and rejoin the NBA. Many felt Jordan was inspired by hockey great Mario Lemieux, who returned to the Pittsburgh Penguins after a three-and-a-half-year retirement. It was Fashion Week in New York City. Designer Liz Lang was a media darling as she presented her very first fashion show and the first all-maternity wear show during fashion's biggest week. Ten minutes into the show, reporters and camera crews abruptly left to head to the World Trade Center. Politics in New York City was heating up as candidates prepared to compete in a primary to replace Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. Senator Joe Biden was vocally critiquing President Bush's anti-missile defense position. In baseball, Barry Bonds was chasing Mark McGuire's young home run record of 73. Michael Jackson was working on a comeback after a concert in New York City. Number one at the box office that week, The Musketeer. 
The number one song was Falling by Alicia Keys. And the number one show on television was Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, hosted by Regis Philbin. Would you like to phone a friend? All right. Uh, we usually start with our discussions with talking about the casting of the film. And these films have so many people in them. It's hard to pick out. Obviously, they're more important characters, but it's hard to pick out. Uh, a prominent actor because there's a lot of prominent actors in these films. So I thought it'd be a little bit of a change of pace if maybe we picked out someone that we each of us liked in the film and hopefully we don't overlap. But can we pick out someone we hate too? Sure. If you want to talk about someone you hate, but somebody in the film that uh, drew your attention and Matt, since this is your film, I'll let you go first. You know, I really, I really like casting Elijah Wood as Frodo because I, I remember him as the goofy kid, in in those 90s movies and i think he's probably well suited to to play the hobbit type um because he's short (laughs) well he's short and he's kind of got that innocent kind of non-threatening feel to him which is probably why he had that career in goofy movies in the 90s i um i hate the tyler what's her face live tyler what's her face yeah I, i can't stand her in any movie And especially this one. She just feels like she's working too hard all the time. And maybe it was just because um, movies like Armageddon were just that bad. And I can't forgive her for it. But I don't don't like her in this movie, and I don't like her in any movie. You ever see Empire Records? She was pretty good in that movie. No, I've not not seen that. Oh, that's a great movie. That's on our list to watch, too. Yeah. Or That Thing You Do. No, see, that's not my bag, you know? (laughs) All right, Laurie, who who was your standout in the film? I thought this was such a great ensemble cast. I I didn't I I didn't, you know, focus on one person and I didn't I didn't greatly dislike anyone as our friend Matt did. <laughs> but um if I had to pick somebody, I guess I would pick um Ian McKellen. That you dislike um, or like? No, that I liked the the most. I he he's but I just felt I just feel like this this um, cast is is such an ensemble and and I agree I really liked Elijah Wood I did like Liv Tyler there wasn't anyone that I just thought oh I can't believe they're in this role I I just felt like it was great casting I gotta say if you had an MVP I, I really would have picked Ian McKellen I think if you if you if that's the one role that if you swapped with somebody else might have taken the movie down too much but. I didn't want to pick him for mine because I thought that was – I let somebody else pick him. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, Chris, who did you pick? That orc on the second hour and 30 <laughs> minutes, on, I think he was orc number 362. He was on the right. He held that sword like nobody I've ever seen. The one that killed Boromir? Uh, no, no, no. The one that got killed by his buddy when he went, walked into his sword. But it's brief. You only see it for a couple <laughs> seconds. That one. Okay. Anybody you disliked? Or number uh, five? <laughs> no, I, I'm going to uh, agree with um, with everybody so far that the, the casting of Gandalf was perfect. And uh, I liked him a lot. And I, I kind of have, I don't know if I dislike Sean Astin's character in this or if I dislike Sean a- Astin, Astin's performance in this uh, film, but uh, that one seemed a little overbearing. I know he was supposed to be overbearing, but he was pretty annoying to me. Have you seen all three films? I have seen all three films, but I've only seen them once because that's a huge investment. It's funny because I think like Sean Astin is the best actor and character in the third film. I think he his character kind of comes around and it's, you know, in this film, he's kind of nothing, but I think he's the, one of the most interesting characters by the end of the series. So mm-hmm. no, I, uh, I, it's been so long since I've seen it that I couldn't, uh, agree or disagree with that. All right. I, I picked Sean Bean who played Boromir, uh, and mainly cause I don't like the only thing I can recall. And granted it's been years since I've seen him and he's become a much bigger actor since then this film is I remember him in Patriot games in the early nineties. And this was the first time I'd seen him anything in a long time. And I really liked kind of this, this character who's 
he's he's tempted they go it goes against his better nature but because he's he's a a feeble man who can easily be corrupted by the evil of the ring i thought he was very in, i thought his character was very interesting and and his acting was it, it, especially the last portion of the film when he swings kind of both ways of trying to get the ring from frodo and then then essentially trying to defend frodo before he's ultimately killed but i i thought he was really good in it the person I didn't like is I'm going to go with Matt. Liv Tyler annoys the crap out of me through this entire series. I mean, I, I've i read the books. I know I, I've never read the appendices and all the other supplemental materials to the the major stories, and I know her character is supposed to be somewhere in there, but she's not in the books, and I thought she was just added to give a strong female character so that the women would have more interest in going to see this film. But I don't think she she does really anything important, so... She rides a horse. She does ride a horse, but Liv- when Strider could have done that himself, yeah. but but I don't find Liv Tyler that good of an actor, and I think she's very out of place in here. All right, let's talk about the director, Peter Jackson. Well, obviously, this was a major undertaking when he decided he was going to try to basically film this film series, which arguably can be say is a a classic book series with a lot of very strong fans you know fans who would demand that it be you be very loyal to the books and that it be done well and he took a lot of liberties with the books as far as adding characters primarily the Liv Tyler character who's not actually in these the, the main story she's referenced in I guess one of the appendices but not a, a character in the books and then of course talking about his general career is he loves special effects and it seems that's what he does is do special effects films and it does he do too much uh in these particular films i don't know how you could have too much special effects in this story (laughs) i mean it's a story of magic and so i i think he did a great job i have to uh put out there that i have not read the books I think I confess to you all, I tried reading The Hobbit when I was in junior high, and it's one of the few books I couldn't finish. And I'm, I'm not a fantasy person, though, either. Um, although I, I'm weird. Sometimes I will like something. Unless but, it involves Mr. Darcy. <laughs> that's not fantasy. But, oh, yes, it is. It's the, female the fantasy. Regency romanticism. No, I'm just kidding. But... but I I thought he he did a great job, and I I have a lot of friends, and my family are very loyal Lord of the Rings fans. They loved the books, and and they were very very happy with the movies, and and loved them. So, Chris, you're one of the literature people here. Have you ever read the books? You know, it's funny that uh, I have read about half of it, and I couldn't get through it. I. It was just too dry for me, which is funny because The Hobbit is one of my favorite books ever, and um, I just could not get through The Lord of the Rings. So, and I, uh, and other people told me The Hobbit was the was boring, but the other three were were really good books. That yeah, I I don't know why I couldn't get into it, but I've tried. I've tried on a number of occasions, but I could not. And I had a hard time following the movie. And I don't know if that's because I didn't read the books, but, you know, you're naming these characters and and they have such strange names and stuff that it was hard for me only seeing it once to um, follow it. I think it has to do with your interest because, you know, Mr. Darcy and Mr. (laughs) Covington or Miss Covington. I don't know. It's that English, you know, floppy guy. You know, that's all I know them as. Mr. Floppy to you. Uh, yeah, Mr. <laughs> Floppy to me. How dare you, sir? How dare you, indeed? But I've read that book and seen those movies a hundred times. And I, I think that's I what it comes down to, is the interest that you show in the, 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 the source material as well as the film. Okay, point taken. All right. So pay a little more attention next time. That's all I'm saying. Yep. Yes, sir. I'm, There's I'm seven more my... hours of this movie, Lori. <laughs> pay attention <laughs> through all of them. I feel like I need my knuckles wrapped. I just want to say one more thing. As far as the special effects for this film, Peter Jackson can go over the top in a lot of his with special effects, but I thought this one was actually pretty well um, reserved for his style and fit uh, the whole theme and the world that he created for it. So a, a few things. I, I think 
editing this movie must have been an incredible undertaking because the shots are all extremely short, and there's so many of them. And in fact, and there are places where it's very poorly edited, and you can clearly tell that the uh, speaker who has his back to the camera has been edited in when he's not saying you know his his body doesn't match the voiceover, and it can be a little distracting at times. And I think if this movie has one weakness, it's definitely the fights and the action sequences because, I mean, the fights are just horrible. There are guys just standing there waiting to get stabbed, and it, people are behaving irrationally. And it's it's it, that, I just thought, were at times bad. And the action sequences were at times a little too um, – uh, just a little overblown and, and people, you know, leaping from stone to stone. I doesn't really do it for me. But what I think as a director, he does very, very well is he captures the tone of the movie. And I like the pace of the movie because we're, we're dealing with this long drawn out journey and we're dealing with characters who are going to undergo pretty significant changes over time. And I think that does require some time to tell the story in a way that brings you along with the characters. And I think of the um, the two most kind of uh, potent points in the movie for me, I thought, were one where Gandalf confronts that, that demon on the stone bridge. And, um, you know, it's not one of those spectacular fights with the elves flying around and all that stuff. It's just a good dramatic moment of confrontation, even though he's fighting a cartoon. I mean, let's, let's face it. And the other moment I really like is when Sean Bean takes the – they're up on that snowy mountain and the ring falls off Frodo and Sean Bean picks it up and has that moment of reflection about how much anxiety they're suffering over this tiny thing. You know, I thought that's when, when Jackson was at his best, not when he was, you know, throwing orcs and goblins on, on, onto people's swords. <laughs> well, I like Peter Jackson. I, I think he's good at creating popcorn like films. And I do consider I don't consider this one as much as the remaining two in the series. I'm not offended by some of the liberties he takes because the novel is, I don't think it would be as interesting. I like the novels. I, I actually like the Lord of the Rings novels better than the Hobbit. I think of the Hobbit at all, almost like a children's story. It is such, it's got a much more basic straight, you know, much more direct storyline than the, these films do or the novels do. But I do think not, I will agree with Chris. In this film, the special effects are not overbearing. They're, he, he, it's, they're there to serve the purpose of telling the story. I think by Return of the King, it was just like, yes, and now I want giant elephants with spikes and, and things. It was like, well, what the hell is that all about? I mean, it just, it seemed like he just had, it was a special effect for the purpose of having a special effect. It didn't move the story in any way, and that kind of a, annoyed me. But I think in this film, this particular film of the series, it, it's it's a good use of it. What about the length of the story? Anybody have a problem with how long the film was? I mean, how about you, Chris? You're the man who hates long things. That, uh, that uh. is very true. <laughs> no, I just thought that really this could have been two films. It, it seems like in at about an hour and a half mark that, they came to a spot where they could have just put it in half, maybe release one in the summer, one in the, in the winter. I mean, this was also the time that Harry Potter was coming out. And how many episodes did they have for the series? Uh, eight movies finally. Correct. There were seven books, seven books. I mean, it wouldn't have been a complete beginning, middle and conclusion for each of these, but, I, I felt that three hours was just way too long. And if he's adding extra things that weren't in the regular story that were in the appendices, he should have done one of two things, either edit it to a two hour movie, maybe two hour, 15 minute movie, or just make it two completely different movies. You know, I would have, I would disagree with that. That if one is that it's, it's one book <laughs> and I think you should make what I, to me, the money grab that, that would appear to be, by trying to make it into two movies. I mean, that was one of the things that bothered me about the the last Harry Potter book is that I didn't think it needed to be two movies. I thought it needed to, it could have been one if they really wanted to do it. And they did a good job adapting all the other books. And I, I know the idea is how can we increase our cash cow? And they didn't know that this was going to be a cash cow at the time, that it was going to do what it did. 
but that that's probably my biggest gripe with the, the recent Hobbit series is that you're over extending it, you, that's a single book now being extended into three movies and also generally about three hours long a piece and that story didn't need to be extended out that long i think there is a natural conclusion a natural ending to each of these books and to draw the line in the middle of it i think would have been awkward and unsatisfying for the viewer because then i then i'm looking like i'm watching ep- episodic television and I'm not getting that end to the film i will say that i haven't seen the hobbit movies even though I like the the book better than the Lord of the Rings, but I haven't seen the Hobbit movies for the very reason you just said that they pretty much added a ton of filler. And I just have no interest in that. All right. Uh, Chris, you look for deeper meanings and symbolism in films. And uh, there's some uh, documented uh, deeper meanings and symbolism to the Lord of the Rings. What did you see in this film? The the main thing that I saw really was that size doesn't matter in this film. And clearly the, the smallest of people in this, and I, I would presume the most defenseless, were the Hobbits and, and Frodo specifically. But they were the most important. And in many ways, they uh, he was the, the strongest willed character. Obviously, that's why uh, he was carrying the ring. So I, I thought there was a huge theme of don't judge a book by its cover. All right. So so basically it's your argument, Chris, is that the size doesn't matter so that George Lucas once again stole from a previous source and used that for the basis for the Ewok characters? Yes, he did. But that's because back in the day it was just too expensive to make Chewbacca's run everywhere. So. <laughs> no, but you know, those Ewoks, they're pack fighters. Their size adds up. Mm-hmm. Okay, Matt, do you want to head off into your moral universe? Sure. I think you could go any number of ways as far as this film's um, internal morality. And I think that's why you you see a lot of different types of people really latching on to this movie's message. You know, I know um, environmentalists really like a lot of the message. Libertarians like the message. Conservatives like the message. Religious people seem to like the message. There's kind of something for everyone here. So what I what I think I would say in particular is that I, I for me the 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 part I noticed most is how Frodo was able to carry the ring in large part not because he wasn't tempted by it, but I think uh, he was able to resist it because the ring didn't have what he wanted. And so I think the virtue that um, we're supposed to admire Frodo as just his his contentment with the simple life and with the little things. You know, he didn't want the power over anybody else. He wanted to, you know, hang out and read a tree under a, a book and smoke dope with his uncle. Uh, I guess so. I think um, Frodo can handle this because he's the one type of person who's not out there trying to find something over somebody else. And to take that uh, kind of a step further, this goes back to antiquity, and I think I've talked about it in previous podcasts where the hobbits who are basically farmers, and farmers are always set as the um, standard of morals and values of what, um, how you should live your life and how you should be humble and give back to the earth and and take care of the earth. And I think that uh, the hobbits represent that uh, in this film. I know a little bit about like Tolkien and I know that he had kind of argued that he did not write any specific, he did not write the story as a specific theme for anything in particular. He left it up to the, the, the reader's interpretation. Um, I've heard, I think over the years, things like that it's an, an allegory for the atomic bomb or the atomic age, the, the ring itself. Um, and I, I think that's a little bit of a stretch. But I do think that there's certain uh, certain elements of that you could say that there's certain elements of racism in the thing, in the film and the, the morality of that that each of the kind of uh, species kind of keeps to themselves. The elves are to themselves. The dwarves are to themselves. Man is man. Hobbits live in Hobbiton. They they don't seem to work together for the grander good and that seems to be part of the, the the theme of the entire film even even going back to the hobbit to a certain extent is building towards this you know if we work together better thing bigger bigger and better things can be accomplished i think it's a good point 
<laughs> yeah, I think they all were self segregationists. Um, hobbits as well. You know, there was um, when Gandalf was coming into uh, the Shire and he set off the fireworks for the delight of the children, and that one dad smiled, and the mom got mad at him was because he was bringing this foreignness into into their Shire that uh, disturbs the peace. So I think it, there is a very strong theme of self segregation in this film. Well, they kind of lived in different worlds, though, too, right? Yeah, but even, I mean, the kind of the idea of that the creation of the fellowship in itself is a major accomplishment, the unlikely joining of all these different groups of people to establish what at that point in time is going to save their world. Ironically, the fellowship falls apart and doesn't survive. So I don't know what that would be the, the symbolism of, you know, like, oh, well, it doesn't work, can never work. You know, the, it's better that they separate into their individual groups. The hobbits be with hobbits. They can do it on their own. And 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 I think that would go more to Chris's theme of that. The smallest things the the, the uh, don't judge a book by their cover. You wouldn't think that they would, you know, Frodo and Sam would be able to make it to the uh, fire pit and throw the ring in there ultimately because of their size, but they can do accomplish many things because of their size. And well, even Go- Gollum in uh, the, in the Hobbit. And then later in these movies, uh, who is basic, who is a Hobbit. I mean, he is also a pretty important character to this story. So I, I'd say too, that you know, as, as this movie leaves us, everything falls apart. And it looks like they can't really work together. But I think as the story progresses, and especially in the third film, that's pretty much cured. Well, in the second movie, too, when, when the elves go to help, and they do kind of figure out each their own way to contribute to the larger goal, albeit not destroying the ring, but defeating the, the kind of you know encroaching imperialistic armies. True. I mean, I poke fun at the fact that the fellowship fell apart, but this is the first part of a three-part story. So the ultimate unification of all the species of the world or societies of the world is what ultimately is what ends up causing them to win. Even the dead people come back and help in the end. It wasn't that nice of them. It was. It was very nice of them. I mean, what did they have to lose? You couldn't. I mean, that wasn't even fair. <laughs> yeah. All right. We've kind of talked about the ending of the film, but... Let's talk about in the context of, is it really an ending to the film? Does it ha- end on a satisfactory place for you? Is it a natural place? Is uh, There are films that uh, I will use an example that Empire Strikes Back, although essentially a cliffhanger for the third Star Wars film is a very, very natural ending. There's a beginning, middle, and end to that film. A bad cliffhanger, a bad second part, or a bad film that it just so much leads into the next film would be Back to the Future 2, which has a storyline that goes throughout and then literally leaves Marty in the wrong place that you have to wait for six months to see the end of that story. Uh, what did you guys think of this, the ending of this film? Well, it's funny because as much as I dislike long movies, when it ended, I'm like, that, that that's really when it just really does begin to get interesting for me. Um, I do think that this movie starts off very slow and this is where they finally, uh, you know, catch my attention. So I did not like the film ending in this part, but really I didn't want to sit around for another hour waiting for a, another good place to stop. So this did even here, it did seem like a, just a to be continued till next Christmas. So first of all, as far as, this is a good place to leave our characters. I think it's a great place to leave our characters because Frodo has finally come to the grips that he's going to have to take care of this himself and he can't rely on everyone else. So he takes off with Sam. Um, the fellowship falls apart. So it's a very natural place to end it in the plot and with the characters. And, you know, I hadn't read the book, so I didn't know, I didn't know how the story resolved itself when I saw this movie and it left me, um, very eager to watch the next installment. Laurie. I don't have any complaints. Okay. Laurie's simple. So, (laughs) you know, it's funny. When I saw this film, I knew where it ended in the book or approximately where it ended in the book. And I didn't, the, the, where it ended didn't bother me because this, this film was essentially about the coming together and eventually the breaking of the fellowship. And that's, that was the, the substance of the first novel. And I was very satisfied with it. But when I saw this in the theaters, the first time I saw it with my wife, who is not, 
a fan of the books, not, not to say that she didn't like them. She became a huge fan of the film series and actually went back and read, I think, at least two of the three books uh, because she liked the film so much. But she was incredibly, incredibly frustrated after seeing this film because uh, much like Chris, she said it was just getting interesting. It was just something was starting to finally happen. This is her least favorite of the three films because she's like, there's so finally action. There finally there's conflict. There's something going on and they just end it. And I have to wait a year to see the the next film to see what happens next. So I, th I think f my viewpoint would be on it, that those who are familiar with the novels or familiar with the story, it, it, it comes to a satisfactory end. But for those who want the ultimate satisfaction of a complete story, it doesn't. It's the first part. It's the first chapter of a three-part book. All right. Let's talk about the film's legacy. Uh, nominated for 13 Academy Awards, uh, winning Best Visual Effects, Best Music, Best Makeup, Best Cinematography, uh, losing Best Supporting Actor, Ian McKellen, Best Director, Best Picture, Best Screenplay, Best Costume Design, Best Art Direction, Best Sound, Best Song. Um, that's right, the song from the film actually got nominated and Best Film Editing. I remember when this one came out, I remember that everyone's saying, I don't know, it's, it's not going to win Best Picture this year because it's not going to win it until Return of the King, which made no sense to me because I also think it's the best of the three films. I was on AFI's 100 Years, or excuse me, I had a character nominated for AFI's 100 Years, 100 Heroes and Villains. Gandalf the Grey was a nominated hero but didn't make the top 100 nominated for AFI's 100 Years of Film Scores, nominated for 100 Years, 100 Cheers. AFI's 100 Years, 100 Movies, 10th Anniversary Edition uh, was actually ranked number 50. Uh, AFI's 10 Top 10s, it was the number two fantasy film of their top 10 fantasy film categories. And Rod what was number one? I didn't look. <laughs> Sorry. Somebody want to look that up? No, I'm looking. I think it came from Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> the the Wizard of Oz. Oh yeah, we talked about that one when we did Wizard of Oz. Number three, incidentally, was It's a Wonderful Life, which I don't remember any little people in, but whatever. <laughs> well, they were kids. Kid, they were kids at one point. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, and Rotten Tomatoes has a ninety two percent on critics and a ninety eight percent on audience. Which actually, I was a little bit surprised that the critics weren't a little bit higher on that. So ultimately, is the is this film worthy of the legacy that it does have, or is it is it worthy of more? Yes, I think it is worthy of the legacy, and, and this might surprise you because I've probably sounded kind of lukewarm about it, but it is a very well made film, and I liked it. So yeah, it does deserve that legacy. I would have given given Ian McKellen uh, an Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. I thought he was uh, the best uh, actor in this one. But, yeah, I think that this is one of the things that as time goes on that uh, their numbers will increase in, you know, once nostalgia builds behind it. I don't really see someone making a, a better version of this in the future. So I think this is one that will hold its own through the years. Yeah, I do. I, I think uh, the score probably doesn't get as much respect as it deserves. Uh, as far as Best Picture goes, it lost to A Beautiful Mind, which, I mean, you know, I think this the same year we have Training Day and we have, like, Black Hawk Down. All three of those are way better than A Beautiful Mind. <laughs> and, you know, two of those m might, be, might be more worthy of a Best Picture than Lord of the Rings. But, um, you know, I, I agree with, with Chris that, McKellen probably could have won an Oscar, but I think overall, I think it deserves that level of respect. I think that Liv Tyler was a little under-respected <laughs> in this film. By me, if anyone. <laughs> well, I would say that she should have been nominated for Best Special Effect because she was she was there to create a, a female appeal for the uh, the moviegoers. So. I really like this film, and like uh, probably uh, apparently same as Matt, I think this is the best of the film series. It's the easily the most dramatic. After this, they become much more action-oriented uh, to the point where the third film is nothing but one big battle after another. I I like the drama of this film. I find this much more interesting film because I think there's not only just kind of the symbolism of a lot of things, but also just the character relationships. You start to see a lot of development in this film that lays the groundwork that doesn't really 
develop as much in the second and third films. Although I really do like the second and third films as well. I enjoyed those films very, very much as well. But I'm also a fan of the Lord of the Rings. So I, I thought Peter Jackson did a very good job translating this film to, or to translating the novel to film. I just, it, it's, I am surprised it's not higher ranked, but I also wonder if, as I kind of said, when the Academy Awards came out, I remember at the time people saying, well, it won't win because they'll wait to give it to the third film. And which, as I said, makes no sense to me, but I wonder how much if, you know, if there's people who say, well, the third film's the best one because it's the culmination of the series. It's the, it's the, uh, you know, it's the climax of this entire story and that's what you give it to. And to me, that makes no sense that you, you give it to the, the films, the third film could have sucked ass as far as I know that, you know, and they would never have given it, but it didn't, it was a good movie as well. And ultimately won best picture. But I think, I actually think the third film is the, the least, least interesting of the three films. I agree with, with everything you just said. All right, uh, let's wrap this up. Would we put this film in our top 100 films of all time? Chris, why don't we start with you? You know, I honestly don't know if I would put it in my top 100. I actually like the second one the best of the three, and I would put that one in my top 100. I think if I were to look at all three of them together as one, then yes, it would. I would put all 18 hours in my top 100. But uh, this just isn't my favorite of the three, so I'm going to say no. Lori? I, I think I would. It's very, it's at the top, close to 100, but I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I would. All right, guys, I, I want to know, we're going to have to take a bet between the three of us, how quickly Lori runs out of films before she gets to the top, she filled up her top 100. I mean, I think you and I, the three of us are going to have movies to go because she seems to be, no, I put it in there. Uh, I love this. Well, you told me I could change my mind. Yes. Remember? We'll, we'll have, we'll go back and change mind changing episodes, but all right. I, I love this film series. I really like these films. I think these films are classics. I think these films are going to stand the test of time, uh, much like the Star Wars films. They'll be watched, uh, or even Wizard of Oz, although I hate that film, uh, will be watched for years and years and will be remembered for the cinematic accomplishment they were at the time. That being said, I wouldn't put this film in my top 100. It's, I really like it. It's very, very close. Very close. But I just... It, to me, it, by itself, it's the beginning of a story, and it's hard for me. It's the same reason I wouldn't put Harry Potter in my top 100. Is It's the beginning of a story that it literally is just a chapter in a much grander scale. If you asked, okay, just taking things as a story, I would put the Lord of the Rings story in my top 100, but the film by itself, I wouldn't. And I know it's a... It's a very small qual, or it's a, a kind of a silly qualification, but I, it, I don't think as a film by itself, it stands by itself. It's just the beginning of something. But Matt, this is your selection, so oh, you have the final word. So let's hear it. Well, it's definitely my top one hundred. But it, if before I rewatched it last week, I thought it would have been a lot higher than it is. I would put it somewhere in my 100 to 75 range, I think. I really like it. I like I like what Jackson has done. I look forward to watching these movies with my kids when they're a little bit older, and I think they'll actually enjoy them. So I, I think it'll stick around a long time and do a great job with it. All right, that does it for this episode of The Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Rings. Thanks once again for joining us and listening to our little bi-weekly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts for Movie House Memories, Mail Bonding, as well as Lunchtime Movie Review. Additionally, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you've downloaded us off iTunes, make sure to rate our podcast on iTunes. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we get from fans of the show. All right. The next episode, we'll be back in a couple weeks when we review Chris's next selection, which is 
Fight Club, which I don't Fight remember. Club. I don't remember what year that came from, but I'm already that breaking. 99? I think it was 1999. It was definitely 90s. But remember, don't break the first rule of Fight Club. Well, we're gonna we're gonna trample that rule. <laughs> well, we'll, so we'll, we're, this will be the first podcast we don't talk about the film. Yeah, we're going to talk about a film, but we won't reference what the film is. All right. Until then, uh, I'm Patrick. I am Chris. I'm Lori. And I'm Matt. And we'll see you next time at our house. podcast is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The theme music for Movie House Memories, Hiding Your Reality, is provided courtesy of Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com under Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. All original content for this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHM Podcast Network, Movie House Memories, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted. <laughs>